Welcome to the Kindle Chronicles, the Friday podcast about your Kindle, books, and all things Amazon. I'm Len Edgerly. Today is November 30th, 2018. Welcome from Cambridge, Massachusetts. I am in the podcasting closet after about five days of travel in Tucson, Arizona, and briefly in at our home in Denver. I had thought that I would do an Ask Me Anything episode, AMA. That's something that I've seen done on Reddit and other places, uh, partly because I didn't have an interview set up, and I knew that the trip was going to be taking up uh, – you know, kind of focus on the trip and where we were in in Arizona and in Denver without having the usual <laughs> time spent setting up an interview and doing all of the things. So I, I thought I would try a, a different format. And here's here's where we are in the closet, fairly late Friday night with uh, just kind of a sketchy view of where we're going to go. But I did get some help uh, when I told uh, you that I was going to do an AMA session for this week's episode. Uh, several of you sent some great questions, and I've got them here, and we're going to just have a conversation, uh, perhaps not as formal a uh, style of podcast as we've as I usually do, and uh, perhaps not as much editing. I, I try to keep things fairly tight. But, you, you know, you do something for 538 times a certain way, and I think it's interesting and useful to say, what if this were different? What if what if this was more a podcast like Dave Slusher does, where he turns on a mic and starts talking, and he tries to talk in an authentic way about things that he thinks people will be interested in, and uh, a little bit off script. Not sure I can do it. This is an experiment. When you've done this many shows and you hope to do so many shows uh, in the future, uh, then if if you try something a little out of the ordinary and it it, it falls flat or disappoints in some way, ah, well, we've, we've got another week. And next week is going to be a tra traditional week because I do have a, an author uh, set up uh, so that uh, it'll, it'll, it'll be back to normal unless this way of doing it turns out to be something that is uh, maybe, maybe the better way to do it. Who knows? Let's throw a bumper in here and get started. In a normal week, uh, as I go through the weekend, I'm catching articles that might be of interest for the Kindle and eBooks and Amazon. I throw them into a Google Docs document that I have, and so I can do this on my phone or I'm traveling or on my computer. So I do have a number of news items that I have been following. The first is that I've always thought that with the blockchain technology being such a creative space and Jeff Bezos and others at Amazon looking into the future, that there had to be some kind of blockchain initiative that Amazon would be undertaking. And sure enough, I'm not sure this is the absolute first, but it's one that I've seen uh, recently. It came out two days ago. Uh, Amazon uh, has announced something called Amazon Quantum Ledger Database, or QLDB, and it's a fully managed ledger database with a trusted, a central trusted authority. Uh, it's on preview. I think some of this came out at the big uh, AWS conference in Las Vegas. I know from my MIT course that I took that there are two kinds of blockchains. One is open, one is closed. This looks like it's closed, and it's Amazon using the distributed ledger technology for different purposes, making it available for customers to use it in creative ways. And I'll have a link to this in the show notes. Uh, it does confirm my sense that Amazon wasn't going to just be sitting on the sidelines as this blockchain initiative unfolds. I will say that uh, having watched the price of Bitcoin in kind of a recreational investing way over the last few months, uh, there was a break in the price and it dropped down to in the range of $6,000 per coin down to uh, below 4000 at one point. And I, I I told Arlene that I was going to do some recreational investing, maybe with a little eye that this could be something that in five or ten years I could be look very smart and feel very good because I had invested a few thousand dollars in it. But each time the Bitcoin price dropped, I threw in another $500, and I think I'm now at about $2,000 of money invested at different price levels, starting out fairly high. 
and I keep an eye on it. It's fun. I go into Coinbase app on my phone each day and say, well, is this getting down toward 3000 a good time to buy? Now it's inching back up. And I've, I've seen lots of – I've seen some coverage that explains some of the reasons that after a period of real steady pricing for Bitcoin, it's now – dropping down and some people predict a bounce and who knows where it goes. So blockchain, that's one of the stories that I was following this week. Uh, just recently, Tom Semple sent me links and I uh, think I heard it from someone else as well. Apple Music on Echo Apple Music to, let's see, okay. Normally what I would do here, snap my fingers going and edit that. So <laughs> pretend that I just edited that out because we'll just launch in again and say that now, uh, starting later in December, I think December 17th, we're going to be able to listen to Apple Music if we subscribe to it on an Echo device. And that's pretty cool, although in some ways I wish it was going the other way because the HomePod speaker, which I have on my desk, I've got a HomePod, a Google Home, and also an Alexa, a couple of Alexa devices, the, I did subscribe to the iTunes Music subscription, about $10 a month like the Amazon and I would like to be able to play my uh, Amazon music on the HomePod because that's the best speaker on my desk. It's interesting to be able to play my Apple music on the Echo Show. The new Echo Show, by the way, has quality uh, that, to my ear, almost rivals the HomePod. It's pretty surprising because it's a much less expensive device and it has a screen, but it kind of booms away on my desk when I'm playing music on it. So if I can switch from my Apple Music to my Amazon Music, both of which have millions of songs on the same Echo device, that's going to be nice. But uh, maybe if these two companies are starting to cooperate, we'll see it the other way, where I'll be able to play my Amazon music on the Apple device. Interesting story. Another story I'll have a link to in the show notes uh, talks about using uh, medical data. Uh, and this one, uh, it doesn't specifically talk about the joint venture between Berkshire Hathaway, Amazon, and uh, I believe it's uh, Jamie Dimon. Is that Chase? I think that's Chase. Uh, this is just a, a kind of a generic story about using medical data, uh, using machine learning, and introducing medical language processing with Amazon Comprehend Medical. This is a blog post at one of the Amazon blogs, so it'll tell you all about it. And it the overall idea here is machine learning, using medical information, which is entered in kind of a chaotic way, a lot of it freehand, a lot of it in different ways, and to be able to crunch the numbers on all the medical data. When I think of all the medical data that has followed me over my life, if there was some way for it to be entered into a way of seeing trends and perhaps applying uh, crowdsourced information about other people's health that had some implications for my own health, that would be great. I think we're going to see a lot more of this coming from Amazon and from that joint venture, which is headed by Atul Gawande, who was a hero of mine, partly because he's such a great writer, but I think he's he's really an intelligent guy, uh, author of Being Mortal, which I'm on my second time reading. Uh, i got a story from Shimon Schott from uh, Poland, and it's about Black Friday ebook craze. Now, he, he, he noted that there, Thanksgiving isn't celebrated there. That's an American holiday, but Black Friday is celebrated. That's kind of a, a global phenomenon. And in this case, there are some really good ebook uh, savings on Black Friday. I'll put this in news. I had a chance when we got back to Denver brief, briefly after Tucson to go down to the Park Meadows Mall in – that's just south of Denver. It's a really nice mall. I had thought that there was an Amazon bookstore there uh, and also that there was an Amazon four-star store. So I was going there expecting to check out both. It turns out there's just one store. It's a big store and it's an Amazon four-star store. I think it's one of only three or four in the country. There's one in New York and I'm not sure where the others are. The idea of these stores is that – that everything in the store has been rated four stars or, or higher, but it's across all kinds of categories. There's there's stuff for pets, there's toys for kids, there's books, there's a lot of gadgets, and uh, it, I, I've thought this is a very odd 
concept. I sat outside the store for a while, and then I went in and spent some time. When I came back out of the store, I thought I would try to capture my impressions because this was sort of my my first chance to experience this retail environment that Amazon is experimenting with. Uh, and this is what I recorded as I was sitting out the, uh, outside the store. Let's see. Today is Friday. I think that was on uh, Wednesday. I've lost track. This, If this is Friday, it must be Cambridge. Here, here are my impressions of that store recorded a, a few days ago in Denver. From outside the store, there is a Amazon four-star sign high up. And in the big windows across the front, it says top sellers, new and trending, four stars and above. There are some items highlighted in the windows. The most attractive advertisement or promotion device is a big screen, big vertical screen that's hanging right in front of the front window and it alternates deals. Today's deals save $20 on an Echo Dot, $20 versus $40. That stays on for a few seconds and then it shifts to save $100 on an Acer Aspire 14-inch laptop in-store exclusive, it says. So it makes it look as if that deal for an Acer laptop is available only in the store. There's another similar size digital display about 30 feet into the store so that it kind of has the effect of pulling you in. And then there are also signs hanging down from the ceiling. There's an area for devices and electronics and then home and kitchen. From the outside it looks cluttered. It just looks like is this an electronic store? Is this a gift store? I see books. It's a real mishmash when you're looking at the store from the outside. I decided I was going to spend a half an hour in there and just take up my impressions and then come out and share them. I ended up spending 45 minutes. I lost track of the time because it was pretty fun in there. Uh, at each display or table, there were items that all, of course, ranked four stars or higher and it resulted in an eclectic mix kind of a crazy mix it just it almost seemed like a random uh, assortment of things almost like in somebody's house if you were visiting somebody and they were collecting say things for pets the gifts for pets section would have the feeling of some strange and kind of wonderful things that are all aligned really close together. Everything is kind of jammed together. And when you're there, you feel like you're sort of poking and browsing to find the things that might be of interest to you. It's like a treasure hunt almost, or a flea market. It's got that feel to it. One thing which I hadn't read about before is that each of the items has what looks to be an e-ink display that gives the information about the item. And this is quite a, an improvement because what it's doing is telling you exactly what the information is in real time on the website so that if someone uh, puts up a new uh, review of a device as you're standing there, it's going to go from uh, 1,673 reviews for the Echo Dot third generation uh, to 74. And I checked this on my iPhone. I was standing there to see if what I pulled up at Amazon.com on my iPhone in real time was the same as on this e-ink display. And sure enough, it was. So this is an improvement over something that I already had thought was cool in an Amazon bookstore, which is that you could go in and use your iPhone to scan the barcode on the little tag by each item and find out what the current price is and you'd get the online information that way. Now you don't have to do that. You, you don't have, you, you can still scan the barcodes of items, but all of that information is visible to the eye without having to get out your iPhone. It, there are simple, attractive little tags this says Echo Dot third generation, sandstone all new. It shows the stars and it says 4.5 stars and then in big text, $29.99. Those prices are the same as on the web so that 
the price in the store is exactly the price that everybody's paying. And if Amazon wants to change the price in this store, and I suppose all the others, it can do that from maybe there's some kind of command central in Seattle where all these things get changed. Uh, I see a lot of people going into the store. It's busy on a Tuesday morning. We're getting past Black Friday. I don't see a lot of people coming out with the yellow bags indicating they bought something. Uh, I ended up buying a stylus because I'm always losing styli and also a clicker for Fire TV Stick because when I was traveling with a Fire TV Stick I realized I didn't have a clicker. A really intelligent guy was in the devices area and I was asking him about the Fire TV Cube which I have, I don't really understand. He gave me a quick tutorial on it. When I said, can it do a drop-in so that I could be seeing my parents on the TV, he said, I don't know, let's try it. And he went over to another person who was in charge of the, the Echo devices, and he tried uh, calling from the Echo Cube, and it didn't work, the Fire TV Cube. So he said, no, I guess it doesn't work yet. Maybe that'll be an update, and maybe you know, an Echo Cube with a little more horsepower might be able to do it. And that, of course, would be pretty neat, because if you had a Fire TV connected to an Echo uh, Fire TV Cube, and you had the drop-in capability that I used with my parents a lot, instead of just being on a Echo Show, which is a nice size screen, there it would be up on the big, big screen TV. So that's maybe something that could be in the offing. Quirky uh, collections of books on display and uh, things for the kitchen and the home. Really, uh, just everything. And everything there, people rave about it. They all get the four stars, which is why they call it the four-star store. I think it's fun. I I would like uh, to spend some more time in there. And I'm glad there's one here in Denver. glad I had a chance to drop into that four-star store in Denver after talking with James McQuivy last week because he did such a good job framing Amazon's retail experiments as experiments, that these are innovations and they're trying things, throwing things against the wall, seeing what works. And this is a very creative experiment. It's it's quite unlike the Amazon Books stores, which now there's close to 20 of them. Uh, This is brand new and it's coming from a different place, probably a different team, and it's, it's out there. If you've had a chance to stop by a four-star store uh, in where you live and you'd like to share your observations about it, uh, I'd, I'd love to hear it. You could send me an audio file, get a little on-the-scene report from your impressions of the store, or you can send me a, an email at podchronicles at gmail.com. Well, let's turn to the AMA, Ask Me Anything, and I've got some questions here that I'm going to answer in, in real time uh, as uh, as they come up on the screen of my uh, Fire tablet, uh, the Fire HD 10. Uh, first questions come from Szymon Schott, who is in Warsaw, Poland, and he asks, what was the most memorable place that you recorded the show? I recorded a show, I believe it was in a game preserve in South Africa. It might have been Madikwe. Darlene and her sister Deb and I were traveling there along with a couple of quilting friends of of Darlene's. And we had a little cabin that was overlooking a a water area where there there were... I think there were elephants. There were. This is about five years ago. I'm, I'm not going to be able to pull up the exact list of the animals, but they were out there just grazing and uh, splashing in the mud, uh, fairly close, you know, of half a football away, of half a football field away. And I was out there on the porch, uh, recording a conversation with Darlene, always some of my most popular shows, talking about reading on the trip and impressions of the trip. And I think there was all kinds of uh, maybe tree frogs or whatever. The the sounds of it were pretty delightful when I listened to it later. But when I think of a scene where I was creating a show, uh, I'll always remember that one in South Africa looking out at a game preserve and uh, had my portable equipment. I'm not sure exactly what I was using to record that show. Uh, very memorable. 
memorable. A similar one was in when we went to the Galapagos again with Darlene's sister Deb. Uh, we spent quite a, I think we spent six weeks in Ecuador and uh, about 10 days of it was on a small boat that cruised through the Galapagos. So we get to see all of the tremendous natural environments that inspired Darwin's uh, or, uh, origin of the evolution and the voyage of the Beagle. And uh, there was a deck up top of this boat, and in the mornings I would go up and write in my journal, and I was putting together ideas for a show, which I I believe I recorded most of it on the boat there, looking out at the islands and the ocean there in the Pacific. It's about 400 miles off the coast of Ecuador, another really memorable spot. Uh, A third one, quite different was at the Southern Maine Medical Center in Biddeford, Maine. And this was a hmm, couple of months ago, I guess. Uh, My mom had a fall at Ocean Park, Maine, and we ended up in the emergency room, and then she ended up uh, being hospitalized because she broke her hip in this fall. It was quite serious. And uh, it was time to put the show together. So I had an interview done, I think. No, I had an interview scheduled with Scott Pratt, who sadly uh, passed away just recently in an uh, auto accident. Uh, so I had to wander the hospital looking for a place that looked like it might be quiet enough. So I found a human resources department in this hospital, a nice regional hospital, very high-quality hospital. And I said, I've got to record an interview with a guy in Kentucky. Can I use your a cubicle here. And the woman said, sure, of course. And I'm not sure she had any idea what I was doing. So I set up my computer and I had uh, one of my travel microphones, I'm not sure which one, and dialed uh, Scott up. And we had a, a good conversation. At one point, somebody came in to uh, run something off the printer, which was right next to where I was recording. And I'm trying to, you know, tell him to not make any noise, but, uh, you know, that worked out okay. And uh, had had a wonderful conversation with him. It's it's uh, one of the things about being so committed to doing the show every week is that it has run up against other events in my life, and it it you might think, oh gosh, you're you're a crazy person to be trying to put out a podcast when your mother's in the hospital. But there was something about uh, knowing that mom was there and. Yeah, there's a lot of emotions. She's, she's 89, and you, we knew we were going to Boston for surgery, and you just wonder, what, what is this? What's ahead here? And I remember that Scott was talking about how his wife had died of cancer fairly recently, and a very strong guy. You know, one of the, I won't say he was macho, but he was, uh, he was somebody who uh, was not an easy crier, let's put it that way. And I could see uh, in, in the Skype vision of him that when he talked about his wife, he, he was getting emotional about it. And, and I felt it because my mother was up a couple of floors in the hospital as I was talking to him. So to put a podcast together in the midst of your life, uh, sometimes the juxtapositions, I think, add some uh, a little, little something extra to it that uh, is, is certainly memorable, and, and I hope that they're of interest uh, uh, to you as listeners. Uh, Shimon's next question is, what are your plans for the future of the podcast? Do you want to reach a bigger audience, or are you satisfied with the number of listeners that you have currently? That's a question I, I spent a lot of time pondering, and I was interested enough in growing my audience to spend some money with Flight New Media in Portland, Maine this summer. Uh, I, I haven't seen a dramatic or really I haven't seen any kind of an increase in downloads since running some Facebook ads with uh, those folks. And that was a very impressive group, and it gave me a chance to see what Facebook advertising is all about. Uh, really, the best benefit of that project was that the flight founder and CEO, Rich Brooks, at one point suggested that I revise the tagline. I think it used to be the Friday podcast all about your Kindle. And for a while, I was trying out different taglines, and none of them were working. He said, why don't you just say what your show seems to be about? And that's where we get this idea that it's the Friday podcast about your Kindle, books, and all things Amazon. Uh, that just sounds right to me. I've been using it ever since. And uh, if that's the only benefit that came out of my effort to grow my audience with Facebook ads, then I, I think it's going to uh, be just fine. What emerged from that experiment, and I was talking to Rich about this to step back and say, am I missing the boat? I mean, should I be having hundreds of thousands of listeners for this show that I'm doing, putting so much effort into? Or perhaps, given the uh, Venn circles of my interests, which are 
gadgets, Kindle, Alexa, uh, books, authors, literature, uh, and Amazon as a corporate culture and Jeff Bezos as a leader. Those are the three things. Those are the three legs of my stool, and they've turned out to be very solid in terms of my interest, uh, what I'm drawn to thinking about, and I, I love talking about it every week. Well, I have a feeling that due to the miracle of the Internet and the way people spread uh, what they are listening to in podcasts, that this audience is uh, really a, a wonderful uh, echo or uh, – uh, image of my own interests in the people that that are drawn to it, and I know that from those of you who I correspond with by email, I've had a chance to meet on travels and having coffee. I always have this wonderful feeling when I sit down with somebody or I hear from somebody by email. This is somebody that's interested in exactly the same things that I'm interested in, and you know, in in random encounters in the world, you sometimes come up against someone like that, and. And you tend to make them a fast friend and say, gosh, you know, we had lots to talk about when we first met. And uh, I think of my friend Kess Woodward in that category that, that, you know, things just click. Well, maybe what happens when you start a podcast, if you have a clear vision of what you're doing, which I I was kind of granted a clear vision to start, uh, and you just keep doing it, that you'll find the people that have those interests. So that's a way of saying uh, the audience that I have. And I think it's somewhere around 2,000 downloads per show. And I used to think that that meant, well, gosh, maybe only half of those people listen because you can download a show without actually listening to it. But when I went to that seminar here in Cambridge, uh, I believe it was Andy Bauer, the NPR podcast guy, Slate podcast guy, said, no, that's not really true because iTunes is the biggest place for people listening to podcasts. And if you subscribe to a podcast on iTunes and you never listen to it, they kind of kick you off the numbers. That doesn't count as a download uh, the the same way it does if if, – You've got a show that you're actually listening to. So when Libsyn reports that I have something like 2,000 downloads uh, a show, you know, it gets up to like 8,000 a month. Uh, that's that's the number of people that – or something like that is the number of people who are listening. Pretty big number, you know. I mean if I've got 1,000 people listening to a show, if, if, if I was in Sanders Theater at Harvard, that would be filling a pretty good uh, – uh, you know, that would be a big haul. And uh, so, anyway, I was an ambitious kid. I'm probably an ambitious 68-year-old. And if there was somebody who could come to me and say, hey, uh, you got a good thing going here and I can help you bump it up to 100,000 downloads or all of that, I, I would be pretty susceptible to that just because more is better. But in my better moments, I think I'm not so sure that more really is better in this, that, that I, I have this wonderful luxury of being able to talk about things uh, that interest me and to talk about. You know, have interesting people on the show, hear back from people, what's wrong with this picture? Fortunately, I don't need to rely on it to earn a living. And uh, so anyway, that's a a very long answer to Shimon's good question about, uh, you know, am I satisfied with the number of listeners? Uh, He also asked, how do you select which book to read next? Uh, I was really inspired by the guy we had on the show from Denmark a few episodes back, and he had that really intricate, nuanced system of choosing books to read and then highlighting them and returning to the highlights. I thought, gosh, that would be so smart. I haven't done any of it. I have uh, the, The one thing that I have changed my reading in reaction to that conversation was I, I've started using samples more. And I think that's something which is an obvious benefit of reading on the Kindle is that you can buy a sample to a book and then you can see if you like it. And I can tell pretty quickly if I'm going to like a book. Uh, so I, I think that's going to be the, the piece of his prescription that is going to start having an impact. I have so many books on my Kindle and in my archive that when a slot opens up, I try not to have more than three or four books in my currently reading folder because that's the place where I I still have my sort of high school ambition to finish the book. You know, it's on the syllabus. If it's in the currently reading folder, I'm going to finish it unless it's just really terrible and I abandon it. I don't think I ever have. So to put a book in that currently reading folder, it's like putting it on the bedside table. Uh, it needs to have uh, uh, 
you know, some some attraction to it. And if I finish a book, then I just go through my archive and say, well, what's another book that I really have been wanting to read for six months or a year? And now I can move it into uh, currently uh, currently reading. There's a different category of books that is developing because I'm doing these author interviews. And, you know, frankly, some of the interviews that I've been doing – that turned out to be great conversations. I I didn't totally love the books because uh, I'm getting a chance to interview, especially with the Kindle Direct Publishing books, uh, authors that are publishing mysteries, uh, suspense novels, some fantasy, not not categories of reading that I'm drawn to just for picking up a book for my own uh, satisfaction and entertainment. But I I read the books. I want to know about the book before I talk to the author. And I enjoy them. It, it, it's like getting out of my comfort zone, writing with my left hand. It, it's an activity which uh, I don't mind, and it's definitely worth spending that time with a book to have a conversation with the author that is, is informed by actually having spent that much time with his work, his or her work. Uh, but but those are the two kinds of reading that I end up doing and, and two different ways of uh, choosing what, what books next. There's no real reason to put a bumper in here, just that I think I've been talking for quite a while, and I'm going to turn next to questions from Mark Roberts. So let's have a little Ramon here. Mark Roberts, who has preached for the West Side Church of Christ in Irving, Texas since 1992, is a, a, a very entertaining and enlightening correspondent in email. We've also shared some barbecue down in Texas when I've been at South by Southwest. So uh, you'll get a flavor of his way of approaching the show in, in these questions. First, he starts with a request. Please stop talking about Moby Dick. I have way too many books on my list to read, and now you're making me want to read it. Well, Mark, call me Leonard. <laughs> not Ishmael Leonard. Uh, I sorry. It, I feel the same way. When I first had a reason to read Moby Dick again, I really resisted it. It's a long book, and as I said, it takes a lot to get a book into my currently reading thing. And uh, am I really going to put this 500-page book about whaling into it? I'm glad I did. I, I settled into it at night. I tend to read it at night, and these very slow descriptions of Queequeg, the harpooner, and sharing the bed with him, and uh, New Bedford just before launching off on the trip. Uh, I I get why this is a classic, and I regret anything I said to disparage the book uh, to my buddies back at Belmont Hill when I first read it. Uh, so sorry about that, Mark. I, I'm liable to keep talking about it, and <laughs> it's liable to take me a year to finish it, so I'm afraid you're going to be stuck with hearing about it off and on. Uh, his first real question ha, is from his beloved Scotty named Carson, and Carson asks, why don't we hear more about Claire on the show? She's the real star. Well, Carson, I appreciate your loyalty to Claire, and, and it's reciprocated because Claire's a big fan of Carson. We need to get these two dogs together sometime. Uh, Claire has at times been a uh, probably early on she's a yorkie so she barks and they'll, i'll be doing deep into some uh, probing conversation with somebody especially at the hooper the cottage that we go to up in maine and claire will be downstairs and when she's there at the beach she's barking 80 percent of the time it seems because people are going by on the street and i'll hear this yip 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 and and I've just uh, – I'm more accepting now. Claire's an old dog, and, and we're not going to have her forever, so I, I'm more forgiving of the background noise that she sometimes contributes to the show. And uh, and she's truly an, an incredible creature. Uh, she was away for – she stayed with somebody while we were on the trip, and uh, it's been pretty nice to have her back with us. Claire says, hello, Carson. Mark's own questions. How long does it take to put together a show usually? Usually, when I'm doing it the the way I, I – except for this show, uh, I don't know, 20 hours a week possibly. By the time I, I'm, I'm reading, I'm capturing things on the Google Docs, I'm uh, preparing for the interview. If I've got an author, I've read the book, I do a lot of preparation of questions for an interview. I'll usually have two or three pages of questions. I always send them off to the person and say, look, we're not going to – 
get to all these questions, but I want you to just uh, see them because they're going to give you a feeling for what I think my listeners are, will enjoy uh, hearing about us. Uh, so all of that goes into the preparation. That Monday and Tuesday is a little light. I usually try to record a Tuesday or Wednesday. Thursday is editing day for the interview. And I, one of the people at that conference was saying, boy, you don't want to edit out all the ums and ahs because that's the natural part of speech that provides some information. So I've tried to back away from that. But I, I, I go through the interview pretty carefully. I, I find links for the show notes that are mentioned. So Thursday can be... Oh, I don't know, three or four hours of preparing the interview. And then Friday is, uh, I call it Podcast Mountain, and that's where I, I write out a script in uh, Google Docs, and then I record, and it's all a pretty careful process that can it can be a good eight-hour day, uh, sometimes uh, well into the night. So, uh, yeah, 10 to 20 hours, and uh, it's... It's become the rhythm of our lives. Darlene is very supportive of it, and uh, she knows. Oh, this is uh, when this is Monday or Tuesday. You should you should be able to go do whatever we want. And, and uh, this is Thursday. Have you finished the interview yet? And then Friday, forget it. You know, it's it's uh, pell mell up the mountain to try to to get this to you in a <laughs> and still get a good night's sleep. Uh, Mark asks, wouldn't you agree that when Bezos said Amazon will fail, he was probably showing regret for not choosing Dallas for HQ2? Uh, Irving is in a suburb of Dallas. Uh, and he realizes this wrong decision will probably end the company within the next 22 hours. Uh, no, 72 hours. Uh, well, if everybody in Dallas were as loyal a booster of their community as Mark Roberts, I think there's no way that Amazon wouldn't have chosen uh, the, the Dallas as the site. And uh, I, I'm sure each of the cities that they considered seriously, uh, it's probably hard to say no to a lot of them. I'm, you know, of course, disappointed Boston and Denver didn't make it. But uh, yeah, no, I, 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 I think he's, uh, uh, I think they chose well, and uh, Dallas will probably survive it. I, I, it would have been fun if it had been Dallas, because who knows? I might have had a chance to have a little more barbecue there with Mark, Mark Roberts and Carson sometimes. Who besides Jeff is your all-time fave interview? I, John Ashbery, I think, would be the answer to that. He was a poet that I studied when I got my MFA at Bennington. Uh, 12 years ago or so, and I just loved him. He's a very difficult poet, uh, and he uh, I had a chance to interview him through Open Road because they published some of his poetry books in ebook format. Uh, Joshua Talent was involved in doing that. So I got, I got hooked up, and, uh, you know, there I am, probably from Denver with my uh, computer recording an interview by Skype with John Ashbery, and he was... In his 80s, he died not too long after I recorded that conversation. He was uh, in New York. He, his uh, helper set it up and said, you know, Mr. Edgerly, here's, here's, uh, here's, here's John or here's Mr. Ashbury. I forget what he said. And a lot of times, obviously, talking to Jeff is a big thrill and, and name authors. I don't think I've ever felt such butterflies in my stomach. I had to just keep deleting the thought. I'm talking to John Ashbery. I'm talking, you know, in, in the very narrow world of contemporary poetry, John Ashbery, another similar experience was with Donald Hall. But uh, to actually be sitting down with John Ashbery and talking about poetry uh, was was really a peak experience. And I had fun with it, too, because I took some risks and I... Uh, I asked him, you know, why do you love to write poetry? And he, he came right back at me. He said, well, I'm not sure I do love poetry. Or There was nothing predictable about the conversation. And that's the way his poetry is. That's why I love trying to uh, drop into a John Ashbery poem, which has all of these language tricks and, and playful uses of words. Uh, and the conversation was like that, that, that I would say something and he would come at, you know, uh, a 45 degree angle from my question to go somewhere else. And in the process, uh, he, he seemed to be talking the way he writes his poetry and, and he, he, his voice was, was very charming, very, uh, kind of a tenor voice. And then I, probably my favorite part of that interview was, uh, I told him what it's like to have ordered one of his books 
pre-ordered it on Kindle, and at midnight it shows up on my Kindle, kind of like Santa dropped it there, and it's like magic. And and he had never seen, I don't think in this process of having his books published, I'm not sure he ever <laughs> even saw one of his books on Kindle, and he just was like a child. He was so delighted to hear what it was like for somebody to read his uh, books on a Kindle, and uh I thought, well, that, that's maybe a gift that I, I gave this guy to, to tell him what, what joy was being generated by his words in this completely new medium. So John Ashbery, rest in peace. That would be uh, right up there with my Jeff Bezos conversations. Next up, John Aga, a listener who sent me some interesting observations, uh, more than just questions. He said that A.G. Riddle, which was the, my guest, who was my guest on TKC 520, was the first author on my show where he had read everything he has published. Now, I wish that were the case more often. I, 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 I think I know that sometimes when we talk to a, a really well-known author, that probably more of you have read the book than not. But I'm sure that if you've had a chance to read someone's books and then you get to hear them, that's that's pretty pleasurable. So I'm I'm glad John had that experience with my A.G. Riddle conversation. I'd like to have another one with him. I think he's got another book out. Uh, John uh, is tempted by the Paper White Four, which uh, we talked about a few shows back, but still able to resist. My wife has a paper white three and i have the voyage both are working great with that said i would not hesitate to purchase a paper white four in a minute if either kindle started to fail i would also like to see a new e-ink kindle which could display the text and read the text via tts text to speech or audible at the same time i agree i think that immersion reading would be a fantastic thing to have on the kindle as well as on the tablets I took uh, the Paperwhite 4 that I bought on this trip to Tucson. I thought, you know, it's got the 3G. My Oasis doesn't have 3G. That will be more convenient at the airport. Uh, I didn't use it. I, I just like the Kindle Oasis better. It's thinner. I do like that 7-inch screen. And so I'm not sure when I'm going to – I, I I really am impressed with the new Paperwhite and what Amazon did to improve it. Very worthwhile. It's going to really establish that as the best-selling Kindle, I'm sure, for quite a while now. But in my own reading preferences, uh, I've, I'm just in love with this Oasis, the, the latest version of the Oasis. But I've got a nice leather cover of it that serves as a, as a stand. And I, I, it won the – if there was a face-off between the Paperwhite and the new Paperwhite and my Oasis, the Oasis won. And on my next trip, I'm just going to take one of them, I'm sure. Uh, John uh, finished. Finally, I'm praying for your mom to continue to improve and have a full recovery. Uh, you know, other benefits of doing this, uh, I, I get – emails from you uh, saying that you're praying for my mom and all that. Uh, we don't know each other. In most cases, we haven't sat and even shared a cup of coffee. But uh, when you get a message like that on an email from someone who uh, you know is listening and is participating in the community, it means something. It, it's it's uh, uh, And I appreciate it. So sometimes when I had lunch with my mother out at the place today and uh, we laughed we had stories about uh, you know how she met my dad and and the the British doctor that she was supposed to go to the prom with and then instead dad swooped in and he he, he found out that Bertie was going to be on a shift at the hospital so dad got to go to her prom at Sudbury High School and you know the rest is history uh, uh, <laughs> she, she's my mother and so she had a, a observation when we first sat down that that I've got furrow marks uh, I, I don't I don't know if I frown so much or if I'm thinking too much but I've got sort of the mark of cane vertical lines between my eyebrows and she said you know i have some cream that if you put that on it every day you could make those lines <laughs> disappear and uh i you know you get to a place where i'm sure if i were you know 14 or even 45 i would have said yeah what are you telling me to use your stupid cream on my face for it what's nothing wrong with my face but i just said 
yeah, how does that work? You know, and you know, maybe I'll try some. I, I'll try anything my mother has to offer uh, at eighty nine, at, at having gone through this really challenging transition to a new place to live. And uh, uh, the other thing I did, this may sound odd, I've been working on her obit and and dad's too, and it's a shared project. They've planned their funerals. They they're very forward looking, and uh, I had a draft of it on my iPhone, and I was reading her parts of the my draft obit about things that happened to her and how when she was a tomboy in Sudbury, Massachusetts, and the boys found out she could hit like crazy. And they say, we want styles. No, you had styles last time. And uh, she loves those stories. And and I learned more about it. That, that uh, I said, well, what was it like when you struck out? And she said, I don't think I ever did. So anyway, prayers for my mother, Lois Edgerly, much appreciated. There's more, and I'm going to carry some AMA stuff over to the next show because I want to share what I heard from Mark Jarvis and Guven Vitavine, uh, Max Baston, and uh, Mark Icero. Uh, some some great stuff that turns out to be more than could fill one show. My guest next week is going to be author Tom Abrahams, author of a post-apocalyptic dystopian series set in Texas. I started reading Home, the first book in his six-book traveler series. I can tell you it's a bad choice for reading at 2 a.m. if you want to try to get a a good night's sleep. This is Len Edgerly in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Thanks for listening. (music) 